Hi, I'm Dan Toomey, an integration specialist at Mexia Consulting, and also the leader of the Brisbane BizTalk user group. In this webcast, I'm going to show you how to consume REST services using Microsoft BizTalk Server 2010. This poses a little bit of a challenge because up through the current release of BizTalk, there is no out-of-the-box adapter available for REST service integration. The next release of BizTalk, 2010R2, will indeed feature a new REST adapter, but this isn't likely to be released until next year. In the meantime, I'm going to show you how easy it is to achieve this integration with the existing WCF adapters and just a little bit of customization. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the members of the BizTalk product team and expert group who first published this methodology on TechNet. If you follow the link displayed here, or simply search on Invoke RESTful Services with BizTalk, you'll find a very detailed article on the same subject, as well as most of the code files that form this demo. I'd highly recommend this as your starting resource when you go to implement this approach. Although we won't be presenting an in-depth discussion of REST in this demonstration, I do want to mention a few features, if nothing else but to establish the context of what the requirements are for consuming REST services. REST is essentially a web application architecture that leverages the common HTTP verbs in order to perform basic CRUD operations. CRUD meaning create, read, update, and delete, of course. If we establish the fact that every unique entity can be addressed by a URL, then we can see how by using HTTP we have a mechanism to access resources through tokens in URL. Like this example, when we request the details of a customer with an ID of 9999. It is reasonable to assume that all the information that a system needs to retrieve a record can be expressed in this kind of notation. If we wanted to form the same request using traditional web services, we would require the overhead of a full SOAP envelope to perform the same operation. While this example is very simple, we can perform much more complex operations by using query string syntax, thereby applying selectors to retrieve certain fields, or filters to limit the records that are returned, or maybe even applying sorting to the result set. Virtually almost everything that's possible with a typical SQL query you could do through URL query syntax. So let's look how BizTalk is poised to perform REST operations. The first requirement is to have a non-SOAP-based method of exchanging messages over the web. Well, the HTTP adapter would appear to be the obvious choice for this. We also have the web HTTP binding available through the WCF custom adapter. So far, so good. The next requirement is the ability to specify the particular HTTP verb to be applied, remembering that this maps to a specific CRUD operation. Now, here's where BizTalk falls down, I'm afraid. The HTTP adapter supports the POST operation only, which equates to an update in REST. We need a way to perform reads and other operations. The web HTTP binding offers more flexibility, but unfortunately there is still no inbuilt mechanism to specify the HTTP verb. So the bottom line is, no out-of-the-box support for consuming REST services. But the story doesn't have to end there. With a little bit of customization and clever use of message structure, we can customize the WCF binding so that we can achieve the necessary requirements for REST consumption, namely specifying the HTTP verb, providing a URL template for which we can bind any parameters to, and even specifying any encoding requirements for both the request and the response. The way we can achieve this customization is by levering the extensions made available in version 4.0 of WCF, specifically message inspectors which can be applied as custom behaviors. Again, a full discussion on WCF extensions is beyond the scope of this webcast, but I highly recommend the MSDN article below if you're not already familiar with this topic. You can use this URL or simply do a search on extending WCF with custom behaviors. The MSDN article gives a bit of insight in the WCF channel stack, including a discussion of the dispatcher proxy model shown in this diagram. The primary purpose of the model is to translate between WCF message objects and the .NET framework method calls. Through the use of extensions, we can see how we're provided with opportunities to manipulate the message as it makes its way through the channel stack. We can inject message inspection and formatting code as interceptors, ultimately transforming the request message into something more appropriate for the service target. 
So how do we take advantage of all this to consume REST services from BizTalk? Well, the first step would be to create a message schema that is capable of storing all the required attributes needed to format a REST request. Namely, the HTTP verb, a URL template capable of binding parameters, etc., etc. Next, we create a custom inspector class that will read these message properties and use them in order to reformat the message into a proper REST request. Once we have the inspector, it is short work to create a custom endpoint behavior that will allow us to attach the inspector to a client endpoint. Finally, we need some way to apply this behavior via configuration. That's the job of an extension element, which will ultimately be registered in the machine config file, so it's available for all WCF endpoints on that machine. As you'll see, this also makes the behavior accessible in the binding configuration of the WCF custom send port. By configuring a WCF custom send port with the web HTTP binding and applying the custom behavior, a message that contains all the required REST attributes within its body can be intercepted by the message inspector, reformatted and submitted to the target service as a REST request. The response is returned via two-way port without any further special handling. For our demonstration, we're going to interface with the REST API exposed by Twitter. Twitter exposes two timelines that are accessible to REST requests. A public timeline that simply lists all the latest public messages, and a user-specific timeline to return all messages tweeted by a specific user. Both of these interfaces are accessed with URLs that take parameters, so it is a fine example for displaying our custom inspector's capability to handle URL templates. And now it's time for our demo. To begin, let's just familiarize ourselves with how the Twitter REST API works. We'll start with the public timeline, which is designed to give us the last 20 statuses from, from the unprotected users. As you can see, we get some XML back, and we get a status element for each tweet, with quite a bit of information about it. Note, though, that for the user, we get very limited information, really just the ID. If we look closely at the URL, we see that we have a couple of binding parameters, including one called trim user. Let me just change that from true to false. And now you'll see that we get much more information about the user. Also, XML is not the only format that's available. Let me just change this token from XML to JSON. And you'll see that we get the same information delivered in JSON format. While we're at it, Let's have a look at the user timeline. We'll use my screen name as an example. And as expected, you get pretty much the same format back, but you're only going to get my tweets. Now let's look at the solution we've developed to access this service from BizTalk. A solution contains two projects, one c -sharp project to contain the, the WCF custom behavior code, and then a simple BizTalk project, which we're going to use to consume the service. We'll start by looking at the request message. As you can see, this message contains all the elements that we need to format a REST request. We've got an attribute to store the method, which will be the HTTP verb. We've got a URI template to store the URI that we're going to access, complete with any binding parameters. So therefore, we have a repeatable parameter element that we can specify any number of parameters. We also have a repeatable header element so that we can add our own custom headers to the message. For example, content type, or if we need any security tokens. Next, let's look at the, the inspector code. So this is a simple C-sharp project, which contains three classes. We'll look at the message inspector first, because that's really where all the work is done. By referencing the system.servicemodel namespace, we get access to a number of interfaces, including the iClient message inspector. This interface gives us two methods, before send request and after receive reply. 
Obviously, in our case, we're interested in the former because we want to alter the message as it's going out. So the first step in this method is simply to do a little bit of validation to make sure that we're getting the kind of request message that we need in order to be able to properly format the request. So with the help of a few XName declarations at the start of the class, we simply check it to make sure that the message is, in fact, the type of message that we're expecting. Next, we instantiate the HTTP request message property. This gives us access to some of the properties that are particular to an HTTP request. So in this case, we use it to set the method from which we retrieve from the request message. So again, the method is the HTTP verb that specifies us what kind of CRUD operation we're going to execute. We also iterate through the custom headers that are specified in the message and add those as well. The next thing, of course, is to look at the URI and to actually set the URL from that, including a resolution of any of the binding parameters that we've specified in our message. We just use a little bit of link to achieve that. And finally, when we're all done, we set the, the, the properties of the original request message to this new object that we've, that we've just created. Now that we have the inspector, we need a behavior with which to, which to house that. So by inheriting from I endpoint behavior, we get a few methods, including the apply client behavior method, which does exactly what it says it does. In this case, all we need to do is instantiate our inspector and add it to the message inspector's collection for the client runtime. The last step is to find a method for us to configure this behavior, and for that, we need to have a class that extends behavior extension element. This basically enables us to add the behavior using the XML configuration that's standard with any WCF service. You'll see that there are two elements to this. There's a, a method called create behavior, from which we just simply return a new instance of our behavior. And there's also a property called behavior type, which simply returns the type of the behavior. Obviously, we will need to strongly name this class and install it in the GAC so it's available to all services on the machine. But that's not the only step. We also have to register it into the machine config file. If you search the machine config file, you'll find that there is a system.servicemodel element, and under that, there is a behavior extensions element. And here you'll find a list of all of the behavior extensions that are currently registered on the machine. We just have to add ours, using the same format as the others, namely the name of the extension and the fully qualified type name. Now, how do, do we get this fully qualified type name? Well, since we know that we've had to install, install the assembly in the GAC, probably the easiest way is simply to use the L flag on the GAC util command. We just type the name of my assembly, which is also the name of my project, and there we have the fully qualified type name. Now, one little word of warning here. You'll notice that the format that this comes back in includes this processor architecture attribute. Make sure that you exclude that when you put it in your machine config file. You'll notice none of the other elements that are registered have that. If you leave that in, you'll find that your behavior just won't work and you'll be scratching your head why. There's an excellent blog post by Dean Robertson on the Mexia blog that describes this very behavior. And I'll leave the URL here so that you can check that out if you want to. Now we'll go back to our BizTalk project. We've already looked at the request message. Obviously, we need to have a schema to specify the response. So basically, what we did was we just um, took the XML from response in the browser and using Visual Studio generated a schema from that XML instance. There's quite a bit of information here, but it's not very friendly to look at, and it's probably more than we need. So what I've done is created a map here that simply takes a few key elements from that response and maps it to a simple HTML page with, it, with a table in it. Since HTML is really just XML, it's really quite simple to do this. 
Finally, we'll just look at the orchestration. Very, very simply, it takes the incoming request message, sends it on to Twitter, receives a response. In this case, I, I just archived the, the full response, the full XML off to the file system before I go and execute my map to turn it into the much more friendly XML, uh, uh, HTML message, which I then also save out to the file system. Really, I probably could have done this without an orchestration. We could have done this exclusively with send ports and filters, but the orchestration just makes it a little easier to show what's happening. Also, because I'm outputting HTML, I needed some way to assign this context property. I could have done it with a custom pipeline component, but then again, that was overly complex for this demo. So now that we've seen the solution, all that's left is to deploy it. You'll see that in my current BizTalk instance, uh, I don't have any applications other than the default system ones, so I'm going to go ahead and deploy the solution. Now to save time, I've created a binding file, and I'm going to go ahead and import that so you don't have to see me create all these some ports from scratch. So after refreshing, I can see my application, I just import the bindings. Now the one thing I haven't done is I haven't added the custom behavior, which because I want to show you how we do that. So if we look at the send ports, here's our Twitter send port. You can see that we're using the WCF custom adapter, and we're using the out-of-the-box XML transmit and XML receive pipelines. Let's look at the configuration. The first thing to note is that the address here is only the first part of the URL. The reason for that is the rest of the URL is actually going to come from the request message itself, from that URI template element, along with the binding parameters. So this part here is actually the static part of the URL. Now, for, with, for the public service like Twitter, that's not likely to change from no matter where we execute it from. But if you can imagine that if you're exposing a, an internal company REST API in, interface, then you might, this part of the URL might change depending on what environment you're in, whether you're in test or development or production. So it makes sense to put this in the send port so that your system administrators can set that as appropriate when they deploy the application. Let's look at the binding tab next. Because we're using a, a WCF custom adapter, we have to select which binding type we want to use or want to build from. So the web HTTP binding is the most appropriate for this because we want to send non-SOAP-based messages over the internet. Now, we do, we, we're happy to leave all the default properties that are set with this, but you can see that there is quite a bit of configuration that's capable, and that's, that's one of the great powers, powerful features of using the WCF custom adapter. Finally, we'll look at the behavior tab, and this is where all the magic happens. You can see that we have the option here to add an endpoint behavior, including the custom behavior that we've created. So simply by right-clicking and selecting that, we get a list of all of the custom behaviors that are currently registered in the machine config file. Now, if you don't see your behavior here, it's probably because you haven't listed it correctly in, in the machine config file. For example, you've got the fully qualified type name wrong. Or you may have forgotten that there are actually two machine config files, both the 32-bit and the 64-bit. I always add it to both, just to be sure, because I never know which runtime process is going to be involved. So here's our, here's our custom behavior right here at the top of the list, so I'll just select that and click OK. And we've now added that. Now, if this behavior had any special configuration properties, conf then they would appear in this box. But in our case, all of the configuration actually comes from the request message itself. So we don't really need that. So I'll click OK to apply that. And now we're about ready to test. I'll just simply start my application. Restart my host instance. And we're ready to submit messages. So, we'll start with the public timeline first. Here's my sample request message. And you'll see that it follows the message schema that we created. I'm specifying the method of get, 
I've got my URI template here, which is the latter part of the URL, and I've got two binding parameters. And I've got those parameter values set right here. Now it's important to note that the parameter name has to match exactly what you put in the binding parameters, and I believe it's case sensitive. I'm also specifying the content type because I want to receive this in XML format. So let's go ahead and submit this message. The moment I have nothing in my output folder, so we'll go ahead and drop this in. Now we'll actually get two output files, remember? One is the full XML response from Twitter and the other is the formatted response, that's the output of, of my map. So we'll look at the raw response first and you'll see that that looks very much like what we saw in the browser previously. But the format of response puts it in a nice little table for us. And you can see that Twitter being an international program we get uh, many many languages here. We're getting tweets from every country. Let's also have a look. I'll delete those. And let's also have a look at a user timeline example. In this case, in this case, we'll look at um, we'll look at my boss Dean Robertson and see uh, see what he's up to on Twitter. And there we are. That concludes our demo of how to execute a GET REST request from BizTalk 2010. We didn't show you how to execute any of the other operations, such as put, post, or delete, but I think you get the idea. Here are some helpful resources that will guide you in learning more about REST, WCF extensions, and even some more advanced REST activities in BizTalk like building a RESTful BAM API. I hope you have found this webcast useful and informative. Please also take some time to visit our user group's web portal, where you'll find plenty of other links and resources. If you decide to join, membership is free, you'll have access to more areas of the portal, including downloads of presentations and code samples, participation in a discussion thread, and you'll also receive event notifications and newsletters from BrizTalk. I promise you won't be spammed, and you can always unsubscribe if you change your mind. Again, I'm Dan Toomey, and I want to thank you for listening to this webcast. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to use the YouTube comment stream for this, or access through the BrizTalk web portal.